I'd like to welcome everyone to the session, look at the evidence, climate journalism and open science. My name is Dimitri Flanagan. I am on the executive committee for Open Access Australasia. And I'm also the manager of Scully Communications at the University of Melbourne. I hope everyone is enjoying Open Access Week so far. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues. So uh, please note that this session will be recorded uh, and will be freely available later on the Open Access Australasia website, along with the many other great sessions that are running throughout the week. So hopefully you have an opportunity to go to a couple that are planned. Um, I encourage audience members to ask questions in the chat throughout the session, um, which may be put to the panelists later in the session, depending on time. Um, and as for our Twitter enthusiasts, a quick reminder that you can tweet about the session using the hashtags, uh, hashtag OA week and hashtag open for climate justice. So I would like to begin this session um, first by uh, acknowledging on behalf of Open Access Australasia, acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples. Um, I myself would like to acknowledge the lands from which I am uh, presenting from today. Uh, that is the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people. We, of course, uh, pay our respects to all Indigenous peoples, wherever they are in the world, including the Maori people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. So this panel webinar will delve into the intersections between climate journalism, open science and climate justice. We are all aware of the great role that the media plays in shaping perceptions of the climate crisis. And this session will offer an opportunity to understand the interplay between climate research and how it is reported. We will also gain an insight uh, into how this differs uh, between Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific, because we are very fortunate today to have um, representatives on our panel from uh, quite a few different countries. So we will hear from each of our panelists in turn, and then we're going to open up to questions. Uh, so time for introductions. Uh, we are joined today by Mark Dolder, a senior political reporter for the newsroom uh, based in Wellington, New Zealand, who covers uh, COVID-19, climate change, energy, technology, and violent extremism. We're also joined by Dr. Shailendra Singh, who is a Pacific media development specialist and is head of journalism at the University of the South Pacific in Suva, Fiji. Veronica Maduna is the founding New Zealand editor of The Conversation and an adjunct teaching fellow at Victoria University of Wellington. And finally, Dr. Jeff Sparrow is a lecturer at the Center for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne. He is also a columnist for Guardian Australia and author of Crimes Against Nature, Capitalism and Global Heating. So to kick us off for today, I'm going to hand over to Mark to speak first. Uh, hello, thanks Thanks for having me. Um, I, I think we've all experienced at some stage or another the, the experience of reading an article about something that uh, interests us, a scientific topic, and realizing that the paper that it is written about is does not say what the article says it says, uh, either because we already know about the paper, or in my case, I go and look up the paper and read it and on a delayed basis realize, hang on, this article has not got this right. Um, so I'm gonna try and explain a little bit about how that happens and why that is often linked to open access issues. So I, I write for Newsroom, we're a sort of independent outlet. We do um, in-depth and investigative journalism. Uh, I focus on scientific topics like COVID and climate change, but I operate in the press gallery in parliament. So a lot of my colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis are mainstream journalists who are working on much shorter deadlines, uh, often trying to process complex topics that they don't have a, a academic background in, um, but that they need to relay simply to the public. So in the case of, uh, you know, the situation that I've laid out here, what often happens is that you will receive a press release about a new paper or there will be some form of scientific 
uh, research released by the government. Um, the editors say that's something that we want to cover. We think it's important. And so people who have relatively little background in any maybe scientific topic or, or certainly uh, the specifics of whatever the latest paper might be on uh, soil carbon or uh, the, you know, modeling COVID-19 transmission or, or a range of other topics that, that governments and civil society and academia cover that are important. Um, these journals will have to read the paper, write about it uh, in a way that their audience can understand. And the audience for most journalists is not necessarily even someone with a degree um, and certainly not someone with a science degree. So uh, when you can read the full paper, it makes a, your coverage a lot better. Um, if you can't, usually journalists will have to just go off of the abstract or even off of other media coverage of that paper which leads to sort of this game of telephone that we sometimes see where uh, sort of an in inaccurate interpretation appears in one publication and um, spreads from publication to publication until it seems to be the, the mainstream narrative about a given piece of research is that it said X when in fact it actually said Y. Um, when you can read the paper, a lot of these, uh, these issues go away, either because journalists have are able to take the time to read the paper to understand it a bit better and to keep that in mind while they cover it, or because um, if they do make a mistake in their coverage, people are able to show how they made a mistake, how the, the research doesn't say what they said it does, um, and the journalists are able to read that, process it, and, and, and uh, correct what they've written. Um, we've seen sort of a good example of how open access can improve coverage of scientific issues through the COVID pandemic. So, you know, there, there have been um, lots of flaws with media coverage of COVID, uh, particularly more recently, but I, I think back often to the start of the pandemic where, um, you know, in the midst of lockdown, people all across, at least in New Zealand, were able to learn about things like contact tracing and genomic sequencing and uh, the differences between different kinds of testing, what asymptomatic transmission was and how that might be slightly different from pre-symptomatic transmission. And these are sort of complex topics that the average person would not have come into contact with in their day-to-day -day lives. But most people in New Zealand had a good grasp of these topics by the end of the first lockdown. And that was because both of clear communications from the government, but also media coverage, which was able to break down these topics. And a lot of that was because uh, academic experts were available to help interpret the information, but also because all of the research that was coming out, both from the government and from independent academics, was publicly, you know, it was open access. Even if it was a preprint or, or, or what have you, journalists were able to download and read the full thing before they wrote their articles, which meant that the coverage was able to capture the nuances of recent research. So without necessarily making um, large sensationalist claims, because there are actually a lot of caveats in most research, but if you only read the abstract, you might not actually get those caveats. And uh, I think when you compare the state of early COVID coverage to the state of any climate coverage, certainly early, but even more recent, you see that a lot of it was um, more directly referencing academic research, better sourced and just generally more accurate, as well as easier to understand for the average uh, reader. And so, you know, to me, it's the perfect case study of how making, uh, you know, increasing access to scientific publications makes journalists' lives a lot easier and it en enables us to do our jobs better. Um, without making the sorts of mistakes that are really frustrating, I'm sure, both for the research community and also for uh, journalists, because you know we're not in this to get things wrong, but um, when you have only uh, a couple of hours to write an article and maybe you've got three or four articles to write that day and you go right up to the uh, paper that you've been linked to and you can't access it, maybe you just read the abstract and get a comment from a talking head and write it up and move on rather than trying to um, seek access through a, a, a different uh, means. So it really is, you know, it can make quite a big difference to this, the quality of a lot of different coverage and a lot of different issues, uh, including climate change. 
if journalists are able to, to have that open access. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. It's really interesting to get an insight into what that interaction looks like for, for journalists with, with access to research. Um, and yes, if, if only uh, publishers who are so benevolent to open up uh, COVID research um, would, would feel the pressure in relation to, to climate change research as well. Um, so I'm now going to pass across to uh, Dr. Shailendra Singh uh, to give his perspective. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Just give me a couple of seconds to put my presentation on screen, please. Okay, I trust that my presentation is now visible. Yes. All right, thank you so much. So I'm gonna focus on the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific region. That's the focus of my presentation. And I will start with the Pacific media landscape because that's where everything should be anchored to, uh, whether it's climate reporting or any kind of reporting. So the Pacific media landscape is characterized by small media systems with limited revenue and also small profit margins. Uh, there's lack of planning and development opportunities for journalists. And because of uncompetitive salaries, there's a high rate of journalists attrition. Uh, we did some research, we published some research in 2021. Uh, we surveyed 21, uh, sorry, we surveyed nine Pacific Island countries and over 200 journalists on their professional views as well as demographics. And we compared this data with the Worlds of Journalism survey, which included 67 countries. And what we found was that in the Pacific region, Pacific journalists are the youngest, least experienced, and most underqualified in the world. Perhaps that's what our data showed. And this is something that has to be factored in into any kind of intervention, into any, you know, any training or anything to do with journalism in the Pacific region, because the context is very important. Uh, one of the features of small media systems is the, dis is the diseconomies of scale. What this means is journalists, they do not specialize in any one particular area. All right, so our journalists, they have to cover several beats. This is the typical jack of all trades, master of none scenario. So I'm not saying this in a disparaging manner because this is quite uh, cost efficient for us and it has served us well. Uh, but there are, of course, some drawbacks. For example, journalists are unable to build sufficient knowledge in any one area. And this affects complex, complex subjects, especially like climate reporting, when it comes to in-depth reporting and also consistency in reporting. So most of the coverage you will see, as I will discuss later on, is news, is, uh, mostly news reporting based on speeches and press conferences. And this is shown up in the little research it has been carried out on climate change reporting in the Pacific region. So now next, I'll go into research into the nature of climate coverage. So research into climate coverage by Pacific Islands media is scarce. One of the few papers is by Dr. Sherelle Jackson. And uh, she looked at coverage in seven papers across four Pacific Island countries. And what she found is quite revealing. In Samoa, for example, only 16 of 14,000 news articles covered climate change, right? And this was the lowest of any news category. So what we have is a major global crisis and the Pacific Islands are in the forefront. And one of the major newspapers in the, in, in the Pacific region, in the country, uh, provides about 1% coverage to climate change. I think this was in the course of one year. Okay, the, now Dr. Jackson also found that most stories based, were based on events like workshops in Samoa uh, with very little new information or in-depth reporting about climate change specific to Samoa. Uh, there were no investigative pieces or stories with new facts. Uh, besides newspapers in the Cook Islands and Marshalls, somewhat surprisingly, 
Even in the bigger countries like Solomon's and Fiji, the reporting in the newspapers they were examined fared little better. Now, if you look at the obstacles identified in the research, for example, complexity of the issue, uh, this maybe can be addressed by training in climate reporting. Accessibility to sources of, of information can be maybe covered by open access to a certain extent. Uh, but what about under-resourced newsrooms? Well, if you want good coverage in climate reporting, you need newsrooms to be properly resourced. But in the Pacific region, across the board, you'll find that the newsrooms are under-resourced. So how do you address this problem? Right, whose responsibility is it? Uh, is it the state's responsibility, given that news media organizations in the Pacific region are still struggling from the effects of COVID and before that, digital disruption? Right, so you can see climate change reporting and reporting in general is posing a major challenge in our region. Uh, one of the questions after looking at the research, one of the questions in my mind was whether climate reporting in the Pacific region as uncovered in the research is discriminatory in nature. All right, because the research shows that the, uh, that the coverage is press conference and meetings focused. So if this is the case, then the coverage will likely privilege elite viewpoints. All right, so the elites are having their say. Uh, but the communities facing the brunt of climate change are muted, so to speak. This is what the research suggests. The question then is whether slanted media coverage is marginalizing grassroots voices. And is this a form of climate injustice perpetuated by the news media? Right? Unknowingly, of course, and through no fault of, uh, no fault of this. So these are really important considerations. Okay, climate injustice, of course, is a technical term, and uh, we are using it in the context of unbalanced reporting and asking whether that is unjust. Okay, the other question that comes to mind when you look at the research is how effective is meetings, workshops, and press release focused climate reporting? All right, this in my mind is a key consideration. So the core climate reporting challenge, of course, is generating and sustaining sufficient public interest. This is quite a task, right? In the face of sports reporting and politics and business and all that. Uh, so if most reporting is speeches and press releases, the question then is how engaging is the material and are people reading it, right? To what extent are local audiences connecting with these stories? Now, this is a Key question if the, if the idea is or if the goal is to galvanize, inform the masses and galvanize them into actions, into action. So these are some of the issues that you know we are dealing with in our region. Now the challenge is, in my opinion, to make climate reporting interesting and relevant. So audiences can engage and also take whatever actions that might be needed on their part. But the question is, is republishing speeches, uh, press releases sufficient for capturing and holding audience attention. Uh, maybe we need more research to find this out, but still. Uh, so my point is, the, my, my conclusion is that the coverage of leaders and experts need to be balanced with communities who are in the forefront of climate change as much as possible, right? The research suggests this is not happening often enough, maybe because of a lack of you know, expertise, knowledge, and also resources. But this focus will help generate questions from the community and pressure leaders to find solutions. Okay, now this is not to diminish what the leaders are saying. What they are saying, yes, should be reported. But there has to be some, because what they're saying is actually helping influence international policy on climate change for the better in the Pacific region. But there has to be some kind of meeting point between elite voices and also grassroots voices for maximum positive impact. Now, in this slide here, I cover one of the risks of pushing the climate change narrative too hard over and above everything. And this is a case study from the Solomon Islands. 
Uh, there's a clan, there's, a, there's certain clans in Malaita living on small coral islands uh, constructed from coral rocks. Now these islands are disintegrating and media policy and development discourse portray the uh, victims of this, this phenomenon, the so-called saltwater people as the first casualties of climate change. All right, but the experts are arguing that there's little scientific information on how climate change impacts specific co uh, coastal lagoon systems. Whereas there is strong evidence of immediate problems that need addressing, problems that need addressing immediately are, for example, unsustainable fishing, logging induced erosion, and lack of fresh drinking water. Now, the problem is, according to the research, this is, our, this is from Wollongong University, the problem is because of the strong push of the climate change narrative, especially in this case, uh, it has become a convenient excuse for policymakers and the state to blame everything on climate change, right? For example, overfishing and unsustainable fishing. So what the researchers are arguing is that they are saying a narrow focus on projected impacts of climate change detracts from the more pressing problems threatening rural livelihoods. When addressing these problems, these immediate problems, will reduce vulnerability to long-term impacts of climate change. Um, I think this is something too that we need to keep in mind because we get a lot of coverage, yes, mostly speeches, you know, press releases and workshop and conferences. But, and these tend to push the climate change narrative quite aggressively sometimes and it's quite saturated. So this is something for us in the Pacific region to keep in mind. Just a I skip that I'm now onto my concluding remarks. Yes, I know time is running out. So I just go back to the basics in some of my concluding remarks. So climate reporting in the Pacific region, we have to remember, it's not that different from everyday reporting, right? In the Pacific region, when you're covering the Pacific, you have to go back a step or two compared to Australia and New Zealand, right? For us, the message is not to touch, lose touch with the realities on the ground or the fundamentals of journalism. Right? We have to use powers of observation and also question things. Now, the powers of observation can be impaired if you are too focused on meetings and speeches and so forth. Uh, the job remains the same, keep governments and leaders accountable. Also, civil society organizations, I should add, because we tend to give them a bit more uh, leeway and space and benefit of the doubt. The coverage should be fair and balanced, of course, and not skewed and elitist, as the research is suggesting. Uh, free access and open science is crucial for understanding the problem and also reporting critically. So this is an area that we need to address in the Pacific region, apart from all the others that I've highlighted. Uh, the newsroom needs, such as journalist training, must be addressed. So without this, climate change reporting will continue to lag behind especially if the goal is stories that make climate crisis appear real rather than far removed and abstract. So again, we go back to my theme of the risk of focusing only on speeches, press releases, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. That was um, compared to a session we had yesterday on, on sort of on the ground collaborative research with local communities. It's really interesting to see that all that work isn't necessarily getting getting back to the reporting cycle. Um, I'll now pass over to Veronica. Kia ora everyone and thanks for the chance to be part of this and to my previous speakers for already raising quite a few issues. I look forward to the discussion. Um, I'd like to pick up on Mark's comparison between climate change reporting and COVID, but go back in time and draw another comparison with something equally significant as a societal issue, genetic engineering. I've come to science journalism from science. I'm a lapsed microbiologist. And even way back when I was a science student last century sometime, I've always been frustrated by just how long it takes between the time when scientists are discussing an issue and at the time that it becomes an actual public um, discussion or enters public discourse. And if you look at genetic engineering technologies, it really goes back to the 1970s when scientists were discussing 
the ethics of using recombinant DNA and mid 70s when the idea of a moratorium was on the table. But it would be at least a decade, if not more, before it entered public discourse as a topic. And climate change, of course, as we know, has followed a very similar trajectory. Some of the earliest warnings several decades before the issue gained more traction and comprehensive public attention. Really, it's probably only the last decade and a half that the public's more directly involved in the discussions. And there are many reasons for that, and a lot of them have to do, I think, with the process of science and how embedded this idea is among scientists that you can only talk about something once it's been peer reviewed, ideally, um, uh, what's the word for it, ideally reproduced by another team and published. But even after publication, it still takes far too long for emerging, emerging issues within the sciences and climate change in particular to get out of that purely in-group academic discussion. And that's why I think open access could help incredibly to close that gap and the time delays. With such time delays, I'm not surprised that when an issue emerges, it's already arriving as a sort of pre-made conflict, the public slightly distrustful because by the time we hear about something, it feels like a done deal and with scientists or the researchers on a back foot. And of course it gives various lobby groups plenty of time to end this delay to prepare any strategies. COVID, as Mark mentioned, has changed all of it in some way. It was fascinating to be covering a crisis as it unfolds as we're all trying to understand what it means. And at the start of it, I really thought that most of the flow on effects of that kind of coverage and that sort of access to research findings as they were coming out um, would largely be positive because everybody had a front row seat. Um, but as we now know, it hasn't really stopped the deliberate or um, unknowing disinformation, misinformation. So I just want to briefly talk a little bit about the conversation, which is what I've set up the New Zealand branch five years ago, but as an organisation that's now been in existence for 10 years, just over a decade, set up largely to counter this spread of baseless opinion and try and focus on evidence-based, expert-led analysis of current affairs. It's an unusual hybrid. We operate just like any other newsroom tracking news and current affairs, but the writers, uh, the scientists themselves, the piece appears with their byline, which gives them ownership. Um, everything's published under a Creative Commons license to make sure it remains free to read for anybody, but also free to be republished by other media organizations. Within that decade, um, starting from Melbourne and from you know, Australia with outposts there, there's now eight editions across the world. Readership has gone up exponentially. And that to me suggests that there is an interest in hearing directly from the scientists. Like many other, probably by now most other media organizations, the conversation has updated its policy on impartiality or balance to focus on where the weight of evidence is rather than the more old fashioned way of you know, all sides of a story need to be told. Um, it possibly took even a step further by declaring zero tolerance of climate change denial. What that meant in practice um, for our coverage is that in some way we're able to sidestep lack of access to published research or limited access if only the abstract is available by simply having the researchers asking them directly to write a lay but evidence-based version of their research. Um, it works really well for scientific topics, include, including climate change. And one of the, the particular series I've enjoyed most was when we had a simple, very simple Q&A um, format to pick up on a reader question and get an expert to answer it. But the limitations of access remain because we use links to the research that is discussed in any piece. Um, and if those are only limited to abstract, or in some cases, not much at all, really, um, not even an abstract, that still leaves a huge gap for readers who would otherwise you know, be able to expand on their own understanding. Um, so even when you know, you're already talking to the researchers as directly as you can, when you're linking readers directly with the experts, even then open access would make a huge difference. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Veronica. Um, that's definitely uh, an idea that will probably have full support of the audience. Um, now I'll pass over to Jeff to, to wrap things up. Thank you so much. Oh, three very hard acts to follow. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. It's great to see so many people attending this uh, important discussion. I just want to make two really quick points. One is to do with morality and the second is to do with politics. So I want to start by acknowledging something that everyone knows but maybe doesn't get talked about as much as it should which is simply that there are vast amounts of money being made by the people most responsible for climate change. Uh, according to one estimate, the fossil fuel industry has made $2.8 billion each and every day for the last 50 years. And that's not just a historical issue. Um, if you look at the figures more recently, the Ukraine war has led to crazy windfall um, windfall revenue for the fossil fuel industry. I think uh, ExxonMobil made $17.85 billion profit for the second quarter of 2022. And Chevron and Shell shattered their own records for, um, for revenue in that uh, period. Perhaps more importantly, if we look forward into the future, uh, the biggest fossil fuel companies have collectively allocated $932 billion to opening up new gas and oil fields by the end of 2030. By 2040, that figure is uh, eye-watering $1.5 trillion. Bear in mind that if these projects go ahead, they are fundamentally incompatible with a stable or indeed recognisable climate. Um, so these companies are essentially um, gambling against the fate of humanity. But the point that I want to make, it's not simply the big polluters that are cashing in on the climate crisis, that there's a whole coterie of people that we might call climate carpetbaggers who are treating the public's concern about climate change as an opportunity to make windfall uh, profits. Carbon offsetting is a really good example. Greenpeace has recently described offsetting as a dangerous scam, saying that it doesn't work and expanding it will just delay real action. But as we know, there are lots of people making lots of money out of um, out of carbon offsetting. Recently, um, Andrew McIntosh, uh, the former head of the government's Emissions Reduction Assurance Committee in Australia, uh, said claimed that more than a billion dollars in Australia has gone to businesses that did not make any real emission cuts as part of the government scheme. So they're just cashing in. There are lots and lots of other examples of similar behaviour. And so I think it's really important to state that it is morally reprehensible to be treating the most serious um, crisis that humanity has faced as an opportunity to enrich yourself. And I don't think that should be controversial. And I think those of us who are engaged in producing and disseminating scientific information about the crisis have a, the crisis have a moral responsibility to set an example here. So in this planet-wide emergency, the publishing industry should not be profiteering. The academic community should not be profiteering. Librarians should not be profiteering. Journalists should not be profiteering. As much as we're able, we should be taking a moral stance against all of those who say that this is an opportunity to make windfall profits. So that's the moral argument for whatever morality is worth. Um, there is, however, a related political argument. In some ways, this is more important. So the figure that I quoted about fossil fuel companies' profits comes from an environmental economist na named Avil Verbruggen. And he says, if you look at the amount of money that the fossil fuel companies are making, you can buy every politician, every system in the world with this amount of money. And I think that's self-evidently the case. Last year, for instance, it's estimated that governments around the world collectively spent $700 billion subsidising fossil fuel. In Australia, the most recent figures were from 2020, $10.6 billion in tax concessions and other handouts. And that's because in Australia, where I'm from, um, the fossil fuel lobby has in immense influence on both political parties which is one of the reasons why the Australian targets fall so short of what the IPCC says is the base necessary to avoid utter catastrophe. And I think as a consequence of this, something I argue in my book, that it is naive to think that governments will deliver meaningful action on climate. But precisely because they have been captured by the fossil fuel lobby, that if we are to see meaningful change, 
we will need a social movement on the scale of that which stopped the war in Vietnam. We will need massive popular mobilizations to force the governments to take required action. Because without that, they will continue to pander to big polluters. And if we are to build a social movement, we need far more grassroots participation in both the climate movement and the so-called climate debate. And we can't allow either movement or the debate to be dominated by elites. I think that's really, really important. In response to climate denialism, many people raise the slogan, listen to the experts. They argue that rather than the airwaves being dominated by paid carbon lobbyists, we should only platform genuine scientists. Now, I'm very sympathetic to where this argument is coming from, but I think the slogan, listen to the, listen to the experts, is quite mistaken. Because while we do need to hear from genuine scientists talking about climate science, we also need to recognise that the way we as a society respond to the climate crisis is not solely a scientific issue, it's a political issue. And because it's a political issue, the politics is not something that can be dictated by experts. The choices that we make as a society are questions we all must debate and discuss. And so we need more participation in those debates rather than less. And what that means, I think, aside, uh, among other things, is we need more scientific literacy. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone can do their own research online and suddenly become a climate expert. That would be ridiculous. But we can and we should be raising the level of scientific expertise, both in the community as a whole and more particularly in the climate movement. We need a wide layer of people, a layer of the kinds of people whom Gramsci famously described as organic intellectuals who are reading the research and discussing it and making arguments about how we should respond to it politically. If we are to build the kind of movement we need, we need that layer of people. And that's why I think open access matters so much. If climate science remains something that most people don't understand and most people don't engage with, it's much easier for denialists and demagogues to spread misinformation. Conversely, the more we're able to create a scientifically informed and literate movement, uh, full of people who are confident to read and interpret the latest reports and documents, the more effective we will be in developing democratic political solutions. Rather than paywalling articles, we should be thinking about the ways to make science radically accessible. And that, of course, raises a fundamental challenge. What might a radically accessible science mean? What might it mean for how journals and databases function? But more profoundly, what might it mean for how articles are written and presented? What might it mean for schools, for universities and for libraries? Now, I don't have the answers to all of that. I know these are questions which Open Access Australia, Australia Asia is fundamentally concerned. And I'll be very interested in people's, um, uh, people's thoughts on this in the discussion. But I think this is an issue of considerable moral significance. And more importantly, I think it's a an issue of fundamental political significance if we are going to um, curtail this uh, crisis that we all face. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jeff. I feel like that definitely brought a lot of weight into the, into the conversation in terms of thinking about the magnitude of the, the power dynamics um, that we are up against. And that is something, um, of course, many librarians in the audience will be aware of in the publishing industry, but obviously that maps out to many, many other areas of everyday life. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in the chat. Um, I did just want to pick up uh, back to a point Mark raised around COVID and preprints. And, and Veronica also talked about this delay in regards to publishing processes and peer review. And I did want to get um, thoughts on, on whether preprints are seen as, as one of those solutions we have to um, opening up research, or if, if anyone here does have concerns around the fact that it is um, not a peer reviewed form of research and how much trust the journalists, you know, um, how much trust do they put in that peer review process? Or are they happy to explore preprint? Um, I, I can go first, just, uh, I, I probably differs from journalist to journalist. I think people have an understanding that peer reviewed is, is obviously more authoritative, but um, in the COVID context in particular, you know, I think the urgency of the situation was such that 
you know, policymakers were making decisions based off of preprints. So it would be um, a bit ridiculous for journalists to then not report on, on them because of that. Um, there probably is some work to be done in, in getting a better understanding across media about the value of peer review and, and the, uh, the sort of importance of taking preprints with a grain of salt, I suppose. But, um, you know, I, I think that that doesn't mean that they should be excluded entirely from coverage either. It's, it's finding the balance. I just quickly want to second what Mark said and perhaps just add that as long as a preprint is labeled as such and perhaps even explain that what this means that it hasn't been peer reviewed that adds to the public you know general readers understanding of the scientific process and it's just one little step towards that what Jeff described as the radical you know opening up science and the, its process more radically and making it more radically accessible. Thanks. And Veronica, while, while we have you there, there are quite a few conversation specific questions in the chat. Um, so that we could combine those. Um, so that one of them is around you know, whether the fact that it isn't picked up by Google Scholar, um, this isn't great for researcher profiles, if more needs to be done to encourage researchers to then put it into their institutional repository and promote it that way. Um, and then there is also a question around the uh, CC by ND license um, and you know, why, why the sort of, have you ever had authors being uncomfortable with the license, not including a non-commercial stipulation, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe the first question first, um, I'm pretty sure the conversation itself would support any inclusion in any repositories. I think that's possibly more the tasks for universities to think through to allow, in quotation marks, their researchers to use anything they publish on the conversation as they perhaps would other public output. Um, from, from the conversation sense, I'm sure there's support for that. Um, in a New Zealand context, it goes even wider because researchers um, you know, output is recognized in their own funding and in their citations and everything. So from our end, yes, but that ball is really more in the employers of academics, universities and Crown Research Institutes in our, you know, at our end. Um, the second question, I haven't had anybody being uncomfortable with writing for us, but I think the bias lies in who actually puts their hand up for writing. If you are on a more commercially funded contract to do your research, then you're possibly less likely to even say that you want to write. Um, so it's a tricky one. And when I do approach people who are not in an academic employment, i.e. universities, outside of universities, it is more difficult to get people to write because often their funding is half commercial. Uh, thank you. So we have uh, another question. Uh, so this one's for Jeff. Uh, given the stranglehold that big profit making publishers have over the proliferation and distribution of research, uh, including their shift to excessive profiteering from models of open access, uh, what actions can we within research institutions take to, to break that publisher control? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um... I don't think it's a particularly simple answer. I think we need to to to, to go back to to to, to basics. Um, I think we need to recognise that academic public publishing is fundamentally broken, and more than that, we need to recognise that academic research is fundamentally broken as well. Anybody who works in a modern university knows that the way that um, the corporate university uh, treats research does not encourage good research habits. Um, it encourages people to look for research points um, for writing, you know, particularly uh, narrow research articles that are read by very few people that are just geared in terms of promotional opportunities and research. Pop and I'm sure everyone here knows all of the problems with um, with academic um, publishing. So I think given the scale of the crisis, we need to be prepared to countenance really um, radical solutions to this. I mean, I, you know, um, 
I think that we should start be, start being prepared to simply flout the, the 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 conventions of academic publishing to get this knowledge out there as accessibly as possible. I think academics need to start thinking about what they're doing with their careers and start to think about how they might address audiences directly. Um, I think there's an urgent need for um, academics to become better at communicating their research, even in a situation where most um, most institutions would prefer you to um, write a, a, a very um, narrow article for a very small audience for which you will get research points for rather than speak to a very large number of people. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with um, wrong with that. So I think there's all kinds of things that we can do, but I think we need to start with the recognition that the whole system is fundamentally dysfunctional. And I wondered if, um, Sholendra, you could comment on whether those same patterns are evident uh, in Pacific region in terms of researchers feeling that pressure to focus more on those traditional research outputs rather than communicating um, in those sort of more translation type outputs, whether it be reports or summaries or um, things like the conversation. And what sort of access do do academics in the Pacific have to, to writing for outlets like the conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, I, ha I haven't got much personal experience with regards to climate change writing outside of academia, but I have written politics and also about journalism and elections and all that on blogs like, you know, Lowy Institute and the strategists. I have not seen any articles written by U.S. academics uh, for the mainstream news media in Fiji or the Pacific. I might be mistaken. It's not that I'm monitoring this, but if they do write, it's rarely seen. It happens on a very rare, rare basis. And part of the reason could be because they are already so busy doing their everyday work. And I don't think writing for mainstream media or blogs and so forth is recognized in their staff review process and all that. So that may be the reason they are not prioritizing this. Right, but I say this purely from casual observation because I haven't really looked into this in any detail. Even for me, climate change is not a major focus. Right? I'm going to election. Um, so we have, uh, sorry, we have a question for Mark around, um, I guess, how researchers generally get around paywalls and how journalists um, do. So, um, Mark, do you use uh, sites like ResearchGate or Academia.edu to access research or do you contact authors or is that too much of a delay? Because these are often the sort of pushbacks we get when we when we ask researchers to deposit in institutional repositories, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I search things like Academia.edu, but I don't know, uh, I don't know how many other people do. Um, in terms of contacting researchers, if I'm if I'm desperate, I'll, I'll give it a go. But because journalists are often working on such tight deadlines, where we 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 don't know in the morning that we're going to be writing the article, we have to have finished by the end of that day. Um, you know, responsiveness is is really a high priority, and um, that's not always uh, you know feasible for academics who may be teaching classes or having busy schedules or or um, you know, not working the, a, a typical week either. Um, the other thing I would say is in New Zealand, we have a science media center, um, which are uh, sort of a team of people who kind of serve as the liaisons between journalists on the one hand and scientists on the other. And they're quite helpful at getting access, but including early access to um, a, a range of publications. So for example, um, for the, the recent paper, uh, I think in Nature on tipping points, um, I had trouble getting my login to work to actually access it, but they were able to provide me with a copy. Um, but, you know, that's the sort of thing where it was quite a big uh, bit of research. A lot of people were talking about it and writing about it, and I wanted to have a read of it to make sure that the coverage I'd been reading in the, in the press was actually uh, reflective of the findings and the caveats. And I think, for the most part it was, but there were bits and pieces that after reading the paper, I, I thought, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have worded it that way. Maybe there was a bit more um, sensationalism than was justified. 
Could I add to it just a little bit that a lot of the, the journalists themselves, of course, have media access if you register with them, you sometimes or often get early access. But all of that, including CIMEX or our own Science Media Centre, is just a few days early for embargoed um, papers. You get maybe two or three days early warning, which ideally you know, is not long enough. But again, I find myself going back to what Jeff said, that's only that sort of plasters on on sort of things that don't quite work, but the bigger system is really not working as it should. Um, on you know many of the crisis points that we face, but even generally, access is just too limited. So we've we've talked a lot about paywalls around uh, research, but uh, I have a question here from Zach, wanting to know, you know how sustainable is it for news outlets like The Guardian, like The Conversation, to be publishing um, without paywalls? Is that something that will be able to continue long term, or um, does that put a lot of financial pressure in terms of having having journalists, for example, that have the necessary skills to cover these complex issues. Uh, Jeff? Uh, my understanding of it, that the Guardian Australia's experiment with um, essentially asking people to make voluntary contributions has been spectacularly successful. Now, I don't know how sustainable that is for, 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 for other publications, but it, it does suggest that there are new models that can be experimenting with and that people are willing to support um, good high quality journalism. I mean, the, the other thing, of course, which is which has changed the equation in Australia is the um, the Facebook Google deal, which has injected considerable amounts of money into the Australian journalistic ecosystem. Now, I think personally, there are all sorts of things that are wrong with the way that that would deal was conducted, I think it would have actually been far more democratic simply to um, tax those corporations properly and then um, use the money from general revenue to support um, high quality journalism. But nonetheless, it has been a game changer in terms of for the first time in the last few years, uh, journal um, outlets in Australia are hiring people, which they haven't been done. Uh, the Guardian, for instance, for instance, has expanded considerably and other publications have um, as, uh, as well. Nevertheless, I think the the, the 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 assumption underpinning the question is a, a completely valid one. I mean that the journalism everywhere is under considerable strain at that moment at, at the moment, and that strain has coincided with this um, crisis, which you know is very resource intensive in terms of good journalism, and those two things together um, is another unfortunate conjunction. Veronica, I don't know if you want to make a comment about the sort of how the conversation is, is funded um, and the sustainability around that. Mm. So in New Zealand, it's slightly different for the different branches, but in New Zealand, it is still only the university's contribution on like an annual fee. In Australia, because all universities are members and yet, you know, you kind of need more funding, there is... Um, donations and you know, annual donations run for a month so a bit like that sort of micro funding coming from individuals from small contributions right through to to larger regular contributions but that's essentially the model behind it to keep things going very different from from mainstream of course I've before my role at the conversation I worked for New Zealand's public broadcaster and you would think that a public broadcaster that, that has a charter rather than a commercial model would perhaps um, you know, put more resources into coverage of climate, environment, science, all those sort of topics and be ahead of the game. But it's not true even for that more public um, journalism model. Again, in New Zealand, we had a temporary extra fund that injected money into public journalism projects because it's just not enough within the within the industry. I don't have the answers to how to do it. My personal you know, preference has always been on some form of public journalism that does not depend on advertising, on commercial contracts, on anything like that. Um, but that does come down to people chipping in, you know, whether that's through a fee, like say that the old British model where everybody pays for their broadcasting fee, or whether that's individual contributions. 
it does come down to us, all of us, democratically chipping into good, sustaining good journalism. Thank you. And as we approach, I was about to say three o'clock, Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time, and uh, other time zones where everyone else is, um, I just wanted to take the time to thank each of our panellists. I think this was a really engaging session um, and lots of food for thought around climate journalism and open science and all the, the skills needed um, both on both sides around bridging that translation divide. Um, I also want to do a shout out to Zachary Kendall, Lookman Hayes and Donna Coventry who put together this really interesting session. Uh, it took a lot of hard work behind the scenes. So I do wanna just make sure that that is recognized. Um, and in the chat, you'll see that there are upcoming webinars for the remainder of the week. Please, if you have time, sign up, but do remember that they are all recorded and will be up on the website uh, quite soon. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>